Section number three is entitled Properties of the Real Numbers. And the first property that one should learn is a commutative property. And we have two of addition and of multiplication. For addition, it says that the order you add two numbers does not matter. And we'll come right back to that in a moment. But first I want to state multiplication. It says the order that you multiply two numbers, A and B just represent any number you feel like the same. And if you happen to like 7 and 9, you can read this as 7 plus 9 equals 9 plus 7. 7 times 9 is the same as 9 times 7. Now, it makes complete sense for addition or to commute. For example, if you're waiting on two checks to come in the mail, one is for $78 and the other is for $23, is it going to matter which one comes first? If the $78 check comes first and then the $23 comes second, well, when you add them, you're $101. And that's one scenario. The other scenario is if the $23 check came first and then the $78 check came second. And I doubt you're going to be disappointed. Say, oh my, I wish the $78 check came first. But in the end, you still get the same amount of money. Okay, where, of course, you may prefer the $78 check to come first because you need the money immediately. But if you didn't need the money, just you care about how much it is, it's the same amount. It doesn't matter which check comes first. It just doesn't matter. If you need to add 1 plus 8 and you like using your fingers, it's very inefficient to start off with 1, there's the 1, and then count 8 fingers, count on your fingers for a total of 8 fingers and say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. That's not efficient. What you should do is do 8 plus 1. If you want to count on your fingers, well, you start at 8 and you add 1. Put up one finger and say 9, and there's the answer. Okay? I mean, if you want to use your fingers, fine, but be efficient about it. Don't start with 1 and then see if I can draw this. On one hand, count all five fingers, and on the other hand, just count, say, one finger. If you don't, excuse me, three fingers for a total of eight. You don't want to do that. You don't want to say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That that's not the way to do it. Start with eight, and then with respect to your finger, fingers or hands, just add one. Eight, nine. Okay, and if you do that, one, that's way more efficient. In fact, I doubt you need to use your fingers to add one. But if you do it that way, what you're using is the commutative law of addition. It says you can reverse the order that you add in. And that's very important that you can see that. It's very important. For example, one moment please. For example, if, if you have two dollars in the bank, and you go to the bank and you deposit ninety-eight dollars, well, that's a hard problem to possibly do using your fingers or in your head. You don't want to go two, three, four, five, six, seven, and count ninety-eight fingers. You're, gonna, now, now, you're only at ten fingers, so you have to 
keep track of how many times you counted both fingers, both hands. Okay, well, don't do this one. Do 98 plus 2. And I'm sure you can say 98, 99, 100. Okay, it's a lot easier to do 98 plus 2 in your head than 2 plus 98. 98 plus 2, 98, 99, 100. I mean, here's 98, and you want to add 2. 1, 2. Well, that number is 99, and that number is 100, and that's my answer. I certainly wouldn't want to start at 2 and say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up to 98, and then say, well, that's 3, and that's 4, and that's 5, and, you know, eventually 100. You don't want to do that. That's completely inefficient. You really should know, and not just know, but use the commutative property of addition. It really makes life easier. A lot of students can skate it. Oh, I know the commutative law. But yet, they won't use it. I'd rather you not know the name of it, but use it. Okay, multiplication. Multiplication, well, that's less useful. But for example, one might call this a seven times, a seven table problem. What's seven times nine? Oh my, I'm not good with my seven table. I'm only good with my, my two, my four, my eight, and my nine times table. Well, this is a 9 times table problem. It's 9 times 7. 63. Okay, but if you don't know what 7 times 9 is, but you do know what 9 times 7 is, well then, you really do know what 7 times 9 is. It's the same as 7 times, excuse me, the same as 9 times 7. If you really don't know what 2 times let me make it a harder one. You really don't know what 7 times 2 is because you're not up on your 7 times table. This is the only, those are the only 4 tables you know. Well, well, that's really, really true. If you only know perfectly the 2, the 4, the 8, and the 9 times table, well, you know what 7 times 2 is because it's the same as 2 times 7, and you know your 2 times table like you know your name. So, 7 times 2 is 14. Those are reasons why you should really know the multiplication, excuse me, the commutative law. You should know the commutative property of multiplication. Another, you, you can also say law, the commutative law of addition. So, commutative law of multiplication. That way, uh, if you only know, say, half your, your times table, and I don't mean like you don't know anything on the three times table, but if on each table, two, three, four, you, you only know half, you know what? You can actually then know all of them. Because again, if on the seven table, you don't know what 7 times 2 is, but on the 2 times table, you know what 2 times 7 is, well then yes, you know what 7 times 2 is. So, if you're a bit sloppy on your multiplication table, well first, it obviously takes you twice as long, if not more than twice, to do your homework. Okay, nobody wants to spend more time in their homework than they need to. But if you were to learn your multiplication table, your homework time would be half. Instead of spending an hour, you only have to spend 30 minutes. Instead of spending two hours, you only have to spend an hour. And your grades will go through the roof. It's really a good investment to learn your times table. But if you insist on not learning it, or in the meantime, if you need to know what 8 times 4 is, and you say, no, I don't know that, you could ask yourself what 4 times 8 is, 
and say, oh, oh, I know that one. That's 32. So you got that one for free. You didn't know what 8 times 4 was. You didn't know what it was. But you know what 4 times 8 is. So now you know what 8 times 4 is. So you can actually know half of the time table, but no, be able to do every problem. If you knew every table except the 7 table, you don't know the 7 table, but you know every other table, you know what? You know the 7 table. 7 times 1, well, is 1 times 7. And you know everything on the 1 table. If you don't, 7 times 2, if you think of it as a 2 times problem, a 2 table problem, you know it. Because you know the 2 times table. If 7 times 3, you don't know because that's on the 7 table. Well, 3 times 7, you'll know because that's on the 3 table. I make life easy for you. You can get away without knowing one whole times table. You don't have to know the seven table, or the four table, or the five table. Know every table between one and twelve, and you can even leave out one of them. You can leave out one of them. Here's the present, okay? You now don't have to learn the eleven table, or learn the four table. That's the present. You don't have to know one of them. Send me a thank you card. Okay. Now, notice that I left, I only talked about the commutative property for addition and, multipl and multiplication. W what happened to subtraction and division? Well, 7 minus 4 is 3. If we did have our subtraction rule, or law, it would be 4 minus 7. No, switch them. That's what the community property said. But 4 minus 7, well, we'll do that. We do 7 minus 4 is 3, but it's negative 3. They're not equal. They're not equal. We didn't get the same answer. 7 minus 4 is not 4 minus 7. Okay, if you're insisting on taking away 7 and you want to get 3 like we did on the first case, the number that go there is not 4, it's 10. Okay, so you can't switch it. The subtraction law of, the commutative law of subtraction is not a law, it's nonsense. Same thing with division. 10 divided by 2. It's 5. I know it is, because 2 times 5 is 10. But if I switch it, I do 2 divided by 10. I don't get 5 for one reason. 10 times 5 is not 2. In fact, I get a half. I get a half. Okay? And once again, they're not equal. There is no commutative law of multi of addition, excuse me, subtraction or division. I kinda gave you one for subtraction. I said if you reverse it, well then you have to put a minus sign in front. But commutative law doesn't say anything about adding anything up. It just says switch the two. Keep the sign in the middle the same. If it always holds, we call it a law. Switch these two. If A times B always equals B times A, we call it a law. But when we switch it, these two are not necessarily equal. Of course, if you have 7 divided by 7 and you switch them, yes, you get the same thing. You get two things that are equal. They are equal. But that's not always true. You know, if you have 7 minus 7 and you switch them, yes, they are in fact equal. I'm not saying that there are no subtraction problems that have the commutative law. I'm just saying it's not always true. Most times it isn't. 17 minus 7 is not 7 minus 17. Only if the two numbers are the same can you switch it. But then again, you're getting the same exact problem. Am 
9 divided by 9. If I switch the numerator and the denominator, I still get 9 divided by 9. Very equal. Okay. Now we're going to move on to another law. The associative or law. Associative law of we do have addition. and multiplication. Multiplication. The associative law of addition says if you're adding three numbers, you could add the first two and add the third to it, or you can calculate the last two and add that result to the first. Multiplication is similar. If you're multiplying three numbers, a, B, and C. Why? You could multiply the first two, and then whatever result you get, multiply by the third, or you can multiply the last two first, and then do A times the product of the last two. Okay, when might this be friendly? Well, 7 plus 2 plus 4. Well, it'll be friendly if you don't know what 7 plus 2 is. If you really don't know what 7 plus 2 is, but you know what 2 plus 4 is, it's 6. Of course, you're going to have to know what 7 plus 6 is, which is fine. But if you didn't know what 7 plus 2 was, well then try it this way. If you didn't know what 7 plus 2 is, you knew it was 9, but you don't know what 9 plus 4 is, Hopefully, you'll know what 7 plus 6 is. You get a second chance of getting it right. 3 plus 2 plus 8. 3 plus 2 plus 8. You can do it that way. Do it this way. 5. 5 plus 8 is not the friendliest problem. 5 plus 8 isn't the friendliest problem. But you know what? I'm real good at adding 10. 2 plus 8 is 10. 3 plus 10 is 13. 4 plus 10 is 14. 7 plus 10 is 17. 9 plus 10 is 19. I can add 10s easily. So, I'd rather do the second case. I'm positive that 3... Well, A, you have to know that's 10. Well, I'm positive that 3 plus 10 is 13. But you know what? 5 plus 8, you ask me that problem a hundred times, I might only get it right 99 times. A good day I'll get it right a hundred times. But trust me, in my life, I got this question wrong an awful, awful lot more times than I did 3 plus 10. It's possible that I never get 3 plus 10 wrong. But once in a while, if I'm tired or if if I'm very busy when you ask me, I might not get 5 plus 8 correct. 3 plus 10, I can answer that in my sleep. So again, it gives you, a, if you're not good with addition, it gives you a second chance of getting it right. If you know what 7 plus 2 is, it's 9. But you don't know what 9 plus 4 is, don't do it this way. Do it this way. 2 plus 4, you really should know is 6. And hopefully, you know what 7 plus 6 is. It's 13. So you get it right. You get a problem right that you didn't even know how to do. You didn't know what 9 plus 4 was. So you can use your fingers and get that. Okay, but I need to say something. So if there's a reason why you might want to use the associative law. Now, in multiplication, I always use the associative law. If somebody asks me what, what a 5 or 6, 8, eight. what's 8 times 4 times 25? Suppose I'm real good with my times table. 
8 times 4 is 32. But nobody knows up to 32 times table. This is hard. That would involve pencil and paper. But you know what? That's 8, and that's 100. I do not need pencil and paper to do 8 times 100. It's 800. Okay? If you actually use pen and paper, you would also get 800. But you don't need to. Use the associative law. And it becomes almost elementary school. This is 100. Four quarters are 100. Four times 25 is 100. Eight times 100 is 800. It ate through this problem. It ate through it. If you want to know what 8 times 2 times 5 is. 8 times 2 times 5. Well, you can do 8 times 2 is 16 times 5. And there's a good chance you won't know that because you don't know what to the 16 times table. Or you can say it's 8 times 10. But the 10 table is easy. It's 80. So, here's the problem that somebody gives you. You convert it, and then you can do it in your head. You can do it in your head. Now, I'm going to talk about one last thing. Well, okay. We'll, we'll come back to this. Now we're going to go on to the distributive law. Now, the distributive law, in my opinion, when it just comes to ordinary numbers, not variables, which we'll talk about later, it's really useless. You have the distributive law over. You have the distributive law over addition and subtraction. The distributive law says if you have some, a sum in the bracket and a number in front, this is the distributive law over addition. You do 3 times 4 plus, and I guess they say over because you're going over the plus sign, plus 3 times 3. And of course that's 12, and that's 9, and the sum is 21. Okay, it's a silly thing to do with just numbers because that's 7, and 3 times 7, why that's 21. Here I did two multiplications and one addition. Here I just did one addition and the numbers were smaller. These are 12 and 9, this is 4 and 3. I did one addition and one multiplication. I'd rather do that. But nonetheless, that's the distributive law over addition. This is over addition. If it were over subtraction, all it means is that the number inside will be, the operation inside will be subtraction. It will be 7 times 8 minus 7 times 5. There will be 56 minus 35, which is 21. I could have said it's 7 times 8 minus 5, which is 3. Oh, what a coincidence. Answer would have been. 7 times 3 is 21. That's the easier way of doing it. But then again, it didn't use the distributive law of addition nor subtraction. That's the distributive law. Let me give you some equations. The left side of the equal sign will equal the right hand side. And the question is going to be, which law did I use? 
which lower did I use? Which lower did I use? Well, the fact that there's three numbers and the order didn't change. First seven, then three, then two. Seven, three, two. All I changed was the parentheses. They used to be around the first two, now they're around the second two. That's our associative law of, we're adding, we're adding the associative law of addition. The associative law of addition. If I tell you 2 times 33 is equal to 33 times 2, if you switch the order of two numbers, and I did, 33 is now first, 22 is second, excuse me, 2 is second, this is the commutative law, associative law addition. This is the commutative law of, well, we're multiplying, commutative law of multiplication. So you have 7 times 3 times 2. 7 times 3 times 2. But I move the parentheses. Here they're around the first two, and here they're around the second two. That's the associative law. This is the associative law of, we're multiplying, multiplication. You have 18 plus negative 3 is equal to negative 3 plus 18. The numbers, they were switched. Here negative 3 is first, and then 18. This is the commutative law, or property. The commutative property of addition. Why addition? I hope it's obvious. We're adding. Three times twenty-one minus two is three times twenty-one minus three times two. That's the distributive law. The distributive law over subtraction. But it's subtraction in the middle. If it were plus, then it would be the distributive law over addition. Now, you do not have the distributive law here. This is not two times three times two times four. A lot of times I ask students, if you're not to do, if you were not to do the three times four first, what would you do? They would say, oh, you multiply the two times the three and two times the four, and you multiply that answer. Six times eight. Six times eight is forty-eight. But let's look. Two times, excuse me, three times four is twelve. Two times twelve is twenty-four. It's not forty-eight. It's not forty-eight. Six times eight is six times eight, and that is forty-eight. The mistake was right there. You don't distribute over multiplication. You don't distribute over multiplication or division. You have two times three over four. This is not simple. Two times three over two times four is eight. The reason that's silly is since you multiply top and bottom by two, you can now definitely divide by two, and you get this number in the bracket. So you really didn't multiply, which is three over four. So you didn't really multiply it by two. You multiplied by two over two. Now, what I want to show you is that if you use the associative law and the commutative law at the same time, well, then things become very friendly. For example, if you have four times seven times twenty-five, well, the 
way it's written without brackets, it kind of says you should do the first two first. Now the commutative law says, see I want to get the 4 and the 25 together. The commutative law says that you can switch the 7 and the 4 times the 25. And now the associative law says keep in the same order, instead of putting brackets around the first two, you can put it around the second two. And the reason I like that is that's 100 times 7. With the associative law and the commutative law of multiplication allows you to do is multiply in any order you like. 4 times 25 is 100 times 7 is 700. When somebody asks you what is 2 times 7 times 5, you don't say, oh, let me go get my calculator. No, no, no. 2 times 5 is 10. That result, 10 times 7 is 70. Okay, it's a lot quicker. You, you, your time is valuable. You don't want to go and look for your calculator. It takes too long. Somebody asks you what 4 times 3 times 5 is. Well, 4 times 5 is 20. 20 is like 2. 2 times 3 is 6. Well, 20 times 3 is just 6 with a 0. That is 60. Else you have to know what 12 times 5 is. I don't want to know what 12 times 5 is. Maybe you know that 5 times 3 is 15. In fact, you should know that. But maybe you know what 15 times 4 is. Okay. Now, another thing. Suppose, see if I can write this up correctly. Suppose you have this problem. Now here, this comes up all the time. This comes up all the time. If you did 3 times 5, let's suppose you know your 1 through 12 table perfectly. But you don't know, here, let's even make this 3. You don't know your 15 table, which is okay. You really should just know up to 1 through 12 perfectly. But I can get around that. 3 times 3 is 9. 9 times 5, well, 9 and 5 are not bigger than 12. I should know what 9 times 5 is. That comes up all the time. All the time it comes up. 4 times 7 times 2. That's 28. I, I have no, well, let's even say times 3. I have no problems with you not knowing what 28 times 3 is. That's not within the 1 through 12 table. That's not. So what do you try to do? You say, well, maybe I can get it to be multiplication where I don't go above 12. 4 times 3 is 12. 12 times 7, you should know that. Okay, this comes up very, very frequently. And this is really cool. And that way you don't have to spend time and run for your calculator. In fact, you should not use a calculator because then you're not going to know your times table. Okay, this just comes up all the time. 3 times 7 times... Well, we just did one like that. Suppose 4 times 8 times 2. Well, 4 times 8 is 32. Most of you don't know the 32 table, which is fine. You don't have to. 4 times 2 is 8. You should know what 8 times 8 is. This comes up all the time. 3 times 8 times 4. Well, 3 times 8 is 24. Oh my, you mean I have to do 24 times 4? No, you don't. Maybe you do. Maybe what I'm saying won't work out. Sometimes it doesn't. But 3 times 4 is 12. Oh, 12 times 8. I know that one. See, it may not work out because, say it was 5. Any two numbers you multiply, 
to 3 by the 8, to 3 by the 5, to 8 by the 5, they go above 12. 3 times 5 is 15. Let me put it up here. 3 times 8 times 5. Well, 3 times 5. Multiply the two smallest numbers, and you get the smallest answer. Why, that's over 12. That's 15. You may not know what 15 times 8 is. Okay, multiply the two smallest numbers first, and you'll probably get less than, there's a good chance you'll get less than 12. What is 6 times 7 times 2? Well, that's 42. 42 times 2, oh my, I don't know the 42 table. Fine, 6 times 2 is 12. 12 times 7, I know. And if you don't know what 12 times 7 is, you might know what 7 times 12 is. Okay, so don't run for your calculator because a lot of times the problems are much easier than you think. 25 times 7 times 4. This is really, really not a calculator problem. 25 times 4 is 100. 100 times 7 is 700. When you're multiplying three numbers and, and two of them are 25 and 4, just jump on it. 25 times 17 times 4. 25 times 4 is 100 times 17. Why, that's 1,700. I can do those, can do problems like this all day long, really quickly. Boom, 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 boom. Because I can multiply 100 by any number. 100 times 13, 1,300. 100 times 7, 18 is 1,800. So, if you say 25 times 4 times 18, in any order, I'll know it. 25 times 4 times 13 in any order, meaning 25 times 13 times 4, or 4 times 13 times 25, or 25 times 4 times 13. However you put it, I see 25 times 4 first, times 13. All right, that completes the section on those properties of our numbers. Okay, good luck with it.